Gina Schaefer is somebody that for a lot that like a lot of people, OG, went through layoff after layoff after layoff and decided, you know what, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Time for me to be the captain of my ship. I thought this was funny when I read about Gina. She's going to start a hardware store. She was the most unlikely person to open a hardware store working in software. She wants something hands-on. Her neighborhood needed some work, and a hardware store was going to be perfect to help people do that. Her house was near an addiction treatment center, and also her first employee was someone who had been incarcerated and lived in the neighborhood, and obviously people needed help. So in this amazing story called Recovery Hardware, Gina goes through it. She's going to share some of those stories about opening the first door. Entrepreneur Gina Schaefer joins me. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I, I'm doing great. I love, by the way, the the I'm at work hardware store retail vibe. For people that You're aren't, pretty. for people. <laughs> for people not watching us, this is what this is the life of retail, though, Gina. Right? I mean, you find a spot and you get it done. You hide in a closet, in a corner, in a back room, under a stairwell. I mean, we, we don't we don't pay square footage rent for pretty offices. Yeah, nope. Uh, it's all got to be out there. Pretty is what the customer sees, yeah. I'm sure. But but I, I want to ask you about your journey to hardware because it's so unlikely. It seems so not what I expected, the beginning of your book, Recovery Hardware. When did you know you were an entrepreneur? Was it at a young age that you thought, you know what, entrepreneurship's going to be for me? You know, I get, in, I get, to, I get in hindsight to look back and, and reflect on these kinds of things, right? So I remember writing a business plan when I was 12. It is not fair for me to say I knew from the time I was 12 that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, or that I was an entrepreneur, but I did write a business plan when I was 12. And then I went through all the traditional junior high, high school, college, get a job routes and didn't remember any of that experience until I started to get laid off from tech startups. But at 12 years old, it was a it was a babysitting company. Yeah, I was going to babysit and uh, my upsell was going to be five dollar milk cartons. Parents were going to drop their kids off at my house and I was going to babysit and make them milk and cookies and charge a little extra for it. I think five cents, to be honest. I wasn't going to make <laughs> I wasn't going to make much money. Uh, but this was Ohio in the 1970s, 1980s. Is is this in your blood because of your mom being an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we were we were scrappy in a really interesting way, okay? So my dad worked on an assembly line and had a second full-time job as a bus driver. And my mom had a home-based business. And I think I just saw lots of different interesting ways to make money. And my parents kind of did all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But y your mom, by the way, as a hairdresser, you had a bunch of... Uh, you had a bunch of fun hairstyles. Well, your hairstyle, no matter what, looks better than mine. I've got like nothing here, Gina. I don't know the color. I see. I might see a little bit of gray on what's left of yours, huh? Um, my mom had a hair salon in our basement. We called it the beauty shop, which is what they were called in Ohio at that time. And the ladies would come every week and it tended to be a gaggle of older women who got their hair done once a week and then they would sleep with toilet paper on their hair. And I think they just didn't move their heads. The concept is hilarious for me. Uh, to think about, but I was my mom's experiment. And so um, it sounds like you've read that section of the book, which was really fun to write and remember. But if she wanted me to have curls one day, I had curls or blonde hair, I had blonde hair and I never cared. I learned to go to school. I mean, fortunately I was popular. I think I can say that without even being embarrassed because this can be really traumatizing for a young girl to show up. Sure, one day absolutely. Like Princess Leia or, you know, some big ponytails. Um, but I did and I loved it. And I think now looking back, it really gave me the ability to, to adapt, frankly. It, well, in talking about adapting, the first thing I wonder, because you say this in your book, you said, I didn't want to do what my mom did. Yeah. Why did you, but, but, but it seems like you would have done that, Gina. Why were you not attracted to having your own beauty shop? Well, I mean, it's, it's definitely not my skill, not my passion or my skill. I think we would have all ended up bald if I was in charge of, of running a hair salon. Um, I mean, maybe I could have run the hair salon, but not actually been the hairstylist, I guess. Um, I should be yeah. I should be practical about that. Um, I help people buy the products to fix their toilets, but I'm not the ones fixing them. So um, I, you know, I was I was made for bigger things. I always dreamed of moving to a big city. I wanted to go into government or work for a big nonprofit. So staying at home and running a uh, small beauty shop or even a big beauty shop was not in my cards. Absolutely not. So we get the we get the entrepreneurship now, but you also 
began um, began experiencing community involvement in in college. What did that look like? Yeah, so when I went to Witten, I went to Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio. It's a wonderful liberal arts school, and I went to get a political science degree because I thought the campus was beautiful. I mean, truly, that's the reason I picked the school. I didn't realize at the time how life changing it was going to be. And the year that I joined was the year that Wittenberg had joined a compact with five other universities across the country to mandate community service for graduation. So in order for us to get our diploma, we actually had to do community service, which required us to do several hours of direct service in the, in the community somewhere, and then um, time spent in reflection, which I like to joke was therapy for college students who had never done anything good in their lives. Um, and so... I also worked in that office, and so I got to see the broad range of of projects that people were doing. Um, I got to experience all the emotions that the students were having um, along with them. And that, I think, really shaped what I wanted to be as as an adult, whether that was to be a nonprofit or then years later incorporate a service and um, employee health benefit whatever into whatever business I was ultimately running. It's it's phenomenal. You tell a story about having to to speak to the football team about this, and and I can just imagine Gina up in front of these football players. Yeah, so I'm five two, and most football players are not five two. Um, I was probably much thinner in college than I am now, but they were. It, this was a Division three school. We always had a very good football team, but it wasn't you know Division one or, or anything like that. But they were very good, and they were very large men. And I would stand in that auditorium, and I would look up, you know, 100 seats in this auditorium filled with all of these guys who were most of them looking at me with daggers, like, what is this chick saying? And, of course, I'm friends with some of them to this day, and we chuckle about the fact that I would go get them after football practice, and I would drag them to an elementary school or a soup kitchen. or um, And several of them I know have still led a life of service that I like to think came, <laughs> came out of my lectures. Maybe. But I but I love this. Well, I love this idea, Gina. Because frankly, uh, when I started working in business, I you know I I thought I should care about my community, but I don't. And 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 I don't mean that flippantly. I'm just going. I don't feel it in my heart. There's no burning thing. And you know what had to happen? I had to get out there. And once I went out into my community and started mixing it up with people and seeing actually what's going on, like that created the heart. It wasn't the other way around. You yeah. know what I mean? I was waiting. I was waiting for the sign from above, and it was never going to come. And it's somebody like you being in my face saying, hey, hey, <laughs> Mr. Athlete, get your butt out there. Like you probably changed some of these guys' lives. I am, I am shocked even now as an adult, how many people are not asked to either donate to something or to give their time. And I have seen so many people's lives change. Even if you just went out for an hour to do something one day, having that direct interaction, being asked to have that direct interaction changes people's lives it, so often. Um, it's really kind of magical to watch and sad that it doesn't happen more often. Yeah, I would tell our whole Stacker community to just dig in. Just take your hands and dig in, and you'll be surprised that that, that passion comes yeah. comes later. But you didn't go into community involvement. You went into tech startups. And I talk on the podcast, well, now over on our Instagram channel, Gina, a lot to these fintech founders, and they're amazing people with these great things on your phone but they're going bankrupt all the time, right? I mean, these wonderful ideas. You lived that life. <laughs> I used to say, or I like to say, that I, I would start getting laid off the second they handed me my business card. And really, I was not the reason these companies were going out of business, I promise you. Um, <laughs> yeah. I liked, no correlation. No, there was Zero nothing. correlation. No, I right. promise. Um, I liked the idea of a startup. I liked the idea of the ground ground floor, watching it build. I mean, that was the entrepreneur in me, right? I might not have been the person starting the business, but I could sense the excitement that came from building everything from scratch. And so I, um, I worked in a nonprofit, which is how I got to Washington, DC. And then I left and I spent 11 months in Brazil traveling around and gosh, if that doesn't frame some of how you feel about taking care of community. And then I came back and started working for these startups and, and they would go out of business and I would find myself unemployed again. So there I was, uh, 2001, I think, was the third and then final time. Hopefully it'll be the final time um, I was ever laid off. 
Well, and and that story is is harrowing to me. The legal counsel is telling you that you're being let go. Yeah. And he tells you that your final task. <laughs> and by the way, I would have said I would have said that I wasn't going to do this, Gina. I don't know how you did it. Your final task was to call the investors and tell them their money's bye bye. That their yeah. money's money's all gone. Like I can't believe I would have told them right then. I'm like, nope. The founders got to do that. Take a hike, right? I had built a relationship with these investors. And so interestingly enough, it was a biometric company that did physical, um, like fingerprints for for physical access, for door locks, which is, you know, we do it on our phones all day now. But at the time, and this was, I guess the mid nineties, it was was still a pretty novel concept. Interestingly enough, all of our investors were from New Zealand. Uh, I was told this, I don't know if this is true, but the folks in, in Australia and New Zealand really embraced this kind of technology earlier than the rest of the world. Again, I don't know if that's true, but that's what the founder told me. And so I had to call a bunch of really, really nice New Zealanders and tell them their money was gone. And maybe that's why I did it, because I knew they were so nice and I had built a rapport with them over the you know fairly short time the company was in business. And so I did it. I do what I'm told. <laughs> I, I can just imagine that that drive back home then um, from from a failed tech startup and this well, what had, had have been a hellacious last day of telling these people their money's gone. And you decide and I love this. You decide like I'm thinking of all these reasons somebody might change their life and you decide that you're sick of commuting <laughs> like number one on Gina's <laughs> list. Is that on commute? But what I like about this, though, Gina, is you're kind of framing things around what really fits me, right? But commuting was was not going to be the first thing. No, I I did not want to commute anymore. I knew in my heart that I was destined to live an urban lifestyle, and to me, that meant walking everywhere I had to go, including my job, or maybe taking the metro, the train, the bus to my job, but not this long, horrible commute that I had to the D.C. suburbs. So tell me this area where you where you live, Logan Logan Square. It's called Logan Circle. Yeah, Logan Circle. Logan Circle. See, I go Logan Square. Yes, it's a circle. Logan Shape. We'll go with Logan Shape. Logan Shape. DC is made <laughs> up of a bunch of circles that were created by the Frenchmen who designed our city way back when. Um, Logan Circle is you know DC like most big cities is broken down into smaller communities, and each small community sort of acts like a small town. We all have or want the same types of services and and we have our own local representation that then rolls up to the DC government. Logan Circle um, was one of the neighborhoods in the country that had been destroyed by the riots when Martin Luther King was assassinated. So obviously that was the late 60s, very end of the 60s. And the neighborhood, I mean, it really went to hell. People left, businesses closed up. Um, it was uh, a, a nice middle class black and white community, and everybody moved away. The people that stayed were the people who you would imagine would live in a neighborhood that had been destroyed. It was the drug dealers and the prostitutes and all sorts of nefarious characters that um, you know had the advantage of living in this beautiful neighborhood for decades while it decayed. And so houses were boarded up. There were no almost no businesses, um, not any there were very few public services. And then late 80s, early 90s, people started realizing that adjacent to some very expensive neighborhoods in Washington was this neighborhood that had a ton of potential. And so they started moving into Logan Circle because they could afford to live there, frankly, um, and buy houses with boards on the windows. And so you're moving in during this resurgence. Yeah, I was one of those young women. I, I love the real estate agent who told me that I had to buy in Logan Circle. She sat me down one day and she said, it's the only place you can afford. And uh, one of the chapters in my book is called There Are No Tears in Hardware. But I am sure that I cried that day (laughs) because nobody wanted to move. I mean, very few people really wanted to move to Logan Circle. But she was so smart. You know, she could feel that something was going to change there. She knew what my budget was. And so she knew I could only afford to live there in a very similar neighborhood. Um, And so I bought a place and then another place. And then my husband moved in to a condo around the corner and we got married and bought another place together and everything unfolded from that real estate agent. But, and I love that you really uh, love this neighborhood. It had been the, the, the black Broadway. Yeah. Uh, uh, you talk about like this had been at one point, just a famous neighborhood. Amazing people that came from that neighborhood. Yes. And, and so CVS moves in, which is a good sign. Yep. A good grocery store moves in 
And then there's this this resurgence happening at the same time that you're being laid off. You come home and you tell your husband, and by the way, I'm like, what? You tell your husband, I want to open up a hardware store. And, and, and I thought, okay, is this just a direct reaction to the fact that she's worked in software, she's worked in tech, yeah. and it's the most non-tech job I could possibly have? <laughs> like, is this like the rebound boyfriend job, Gina? That's what yes. I'm thinking as I'm reading that you're going into hardware. <laughs> It's very practical, right? I used to say that if I wrote a book, I was going to call it from software to hardware. I went from the very, uh, you know, ethereal, you can't figure out what you're talking about to a hammer, something very tangible that builds things. And I was in a neighborhood that needed things built. And that's, that's what it boiled down to. We, um, my husband and I got involved in the community association. It was very active. Every new person who moved to this neighborhood joined and, we all wanted to walk and dine and shop and recreate right outside of our front doors. And Mark and I used to joke that we lived in the dark, our toilet was always running, and our pictures were on the ground because the closest hardware store was, it was like a mile if we walked. And there, was, there were no cabs that came into neighborhoods like ours, and so we couldn't get a cab back and forth, and there wasn't any parking at that place a mile away. And we thought we needed a hardware store. So, And, and, and I love this because it's, it's the... It's your commitment to your community. So it goes back to your community stuff. It's hands-on stuff. It's celebrating this resurgence that's happening. Um, you, you decide to go with Ace Hardware. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ace Hardware sends a guy out. Tell me about the guy that Ace Hardware sends out. Yeah. So um, you probably know this, but just in case any of your listeners don't, Ace is a cooperative, a national purchasing cooperative. So there are no franchises for hardware stores. And hardware store owners either join a cooperative or they buy from a wholesaler. And so we reached out to a couple of the national cooperatives and and, uh, Ace responded first. And they sent a guy to come sort of vet me and the neighborhood. My husband at the time was not going to join the business. And so all of the initial um, interactions were with me. And I, I was telling the story to our bank yesterday. I said, he loved me. He loved the, the burned out neighborhood. He loved the boards on the, the windows. He loved everything about it, which is a total It joke. sounds like he totally got it. Like <laughs> he totally got it. Yeah. Well, I wanted to believe that, right? So I am, I am a very optimistic and enthusiastic person. But really at that time in my life, I was probably absurdly naive. And I really did think that this guy loved what I was doing and could see the vision. And frankly, maybe he could. But he told me to sign my lease and then fax the application to join the co-op back to ACE because there is, a, there is an approval process. And so um, there was a developer in the neighborhood named Jim Abdo. And Jim was very involved in the community as well. And he wanted, he wanted to be the developer that brought a hardware store to the neighborhood. So when we matched up, magic happened. He said, I'm giving you the space that everybody wants and here's the lease and I don't care that you don't have any business ownership experience. And so I signed, I think it was a $1.8 million lease. And then I faxed my application back to Ace and they freaked out. (laughs) Um, They fired the guy because he had lied. I mean, there's no way he was supposed to tell me to sign that lease before they approved me. And so, you know, I mean, really, Joe, I could speculate that he didn't plan he knew that they were going to say no to me but I don't want to go down that route like that route's too it's too sad for me to think about the last 20 years not happening and so he was fired I got a hardware store now I have more and the rest is history (laughs) but 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 there's and there's a couple things here number one was I thought because I'm also an optimist Gina I thought that this guy this guy believed in you but he thought that the people at Ace might not so here's the way we work it around the system to make sure that this thing that I love, maybe he loved it like you did. Maybe. I don't know. I've yeah. never seen him again. So I have no idea. I can't ask him what he really thought. I can't ask if, you know, if he thought maybe he was going to get a big commission if he signed me. I have no idea. I, maybe he really believed in me and knew they didn't. And he wanted to make sure that this could work. Um it was actually know. more. It was actually more surprising to me that that you didn't immediately look elsewhere away from Ace because it sounds like Ace didn't believe in your mission. Yeah, it would. It was. Yeah, there's a lot of things. I mean, I at that point it was just sort of head down, forward motion. How am I going to get this business open by any means possible? And uh, I have so much respect for Ace, and we have such an amazing partnership. I served on the national board. I have hundreds of Ace retailer friends. And the, the story has such a wonderful ending that I can only look back on that time and chuckle. Uh, yeah, 
I don't know what yeah. else to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it and and it and it did all work out, which I like, and I like the fact that there's this guy Jim, who's the developer that you just mentioned, giving a lease to somebody with no experience. When there's many other people out there, Gina, why why you versus all of these other people? Two reasons. One, he really wanted to be the guy to bring a hardware store to the neighborhood, but he wasn't going to open it. And two, we were both from Ohio. I swear that must be it. I sat down in his office. I was so intimidated. He sat me down at a table that had this stack of business plans. Everybody wanted this spot where I opened, which was a really sort of hilarious place to put a hardware store. But right next door was the CVS and right next door was the grocery store. So from a neighborhood perspective, it was very logical to have the next business that opened in this corner building. And we started talking about our past and what led us to Logan Circle. And I think Jim's probably 10 years older than me, give or take. And somehow it came up that we had both grown up in towns in Ohio, actually not that far from each other. And I think it clicked and he gave me the lease. I don't know. What I like that you explain in the book is that you were already at no. You were pretty intimidated, but you're already at no. So I can just imagine the courage it took to go in there, but also to tell yourself that, hey, unless you make a friend and then how serendipitous that you actually make a friend, but you had to reach out to do that, which I think is important to everybody. We're all afraid to reach out. And the fact that you did created this, this company. I had somebody years ago say that I was a shameless self-promoter. I was talking about my business or I had gotten an article in the newspaper or something. And I said to that guy, if I don't talk about my business or what I want, how is the business going to succeed or how are, and how are people going to know what I need or want? Um, and so both of those things sort of tie in with me. I want the, my teammates who I absolutely love and wake up and work hard for every day. I want them to have all the successes in the world with this business when I'm gone and I feel like if I don't keep talking about it to them and to our customers, no one's going to know. No one's going to know how great they are. No one's going to know how wonderful the business, the stores are. And so I, I think we need to ask. We need to be willing to talk um, about what we need, what we want, and about how good we are at some things. I actually had a landlord tell me that once. He said I needed to write a resume that said I paid the bills on time. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was great advice. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that. What did your what did what did you and your husband do? Both of you, you're signing 1.8 million dollars, right? Yeah. This is a th- this isn't a small thing, Gina. Like, what are you? I could just imagine your him must have been shaking while you're signing on the dotted line. No, I was too naive. Uh, Mark is very um, he's he's fiscally more fiscally conservative than I am, but he's also very very smart when it comes to money. So. He joined me about three months in. He decided initially, you know, this was not his dream, um, but he had a well, a good paying job. And so he wanted to make sure that if something happened at the store, he could help me pay the rent. And so that's what he did. And then about three months in, he said, okay, you're cash flowing quickly enough. I think you're going to be okay with rent and you're having a lot of fun. Oh, and by the way, I'm working two jobs because I'm working my own and then I'm trying to help you in the free time, my free time. And I never signed up to have two jobs, he said. And so he quit. And we've been business partners ever since, which has been great because he is the one who makes sure that we could pay that, make sure that we can pay all the rent that we pay. But that's a, that's still a big signature. I just still can't imagine that day. So, so we start off with, you have this neighborhood that you love. You then take part in the redevelopment of the neighborhood, but this is ultimately not about buildings and about streets and about history. Your story and what attracted me to your story, Gina, is this is a story about people and about, well, not just people, because I'm going to name three names that I'd like you to tell us a short story so that people kind of learn about all the different characters uh, that you deal with. Tell me first, tell us all about Tommy first. Oh, Tommy's the best. So, um... You know, I said that the neighborhood had had a lot of challenges for several decades. And so there weren't a lot of people who lived there who could apply for jobs. And Tommy came in early in the business. I think he was really probably employee number one or two, um, had been in prison for 17 years. And I didn't know that because we, when we created our employment application, we banned the box. We decided that we were not going to ask if someone was a felon, which was still legal to do at the time. On purpose. On purpose, on purpose, you decided we're not going to have the box. On purpose. And I don't know really why we thought that initially, but we did. We just, and so Tommy got a job with us. He worked with us for 11 years. He was just an absolutely wonderful first hire. Um, And 
he had been in prison for 17 years. We gave our dog to him, which was very sad because we had to give our dog away. Uh, he took care of our dog. He had a key to our house. He met me at the store every morning to open up with me to make sure that everything was safe and that he was there. Um, everybody loved him. Nobody knew his past. And he sort of set the standard for expecting that anybody with any kind of past can be an amazing teammate. Which is, which is carried through to the way that you work with people today. Yes. Yes. By the way, uh, that, that story includes another character I'd like you to tell everybody about, which is Jay. <laughs> so Jay's the dog. Um, Mark likes to say that I've made one bad decision in my life. God love him. And that decision was Jay. I decided that every good hardware store should have a store dog. And then I fell in love with Great Danes. And so I adopted a Great Dane right before Logan Hardware opened. And Jay came, in to, came to live with us. He weighed 175 pounds. He was oh afraid God. of his own shadow. I mean, I think I weighed 130 pounds at the time. So the dog's like so much bigger than me. Um, he, he was afraid of his own shadow. He had separation anxiety. And he scared the hell out of the customers. He was so nice, but people don't understand what to do with a dog that big. And if I heard one time, how's the horse? I heard it a million times. It was so irritating. <laughs> so irritating. So uh, that's why I, had, I made the comment that we gave Tommy, our dog, because Tommy, I think as a result of being in prison for so long, had a lot of wanderlust. He didn't want to be cooped up. He wanted to be, he would walk all day long. He would ride his bike all day long. He had friends all over town that he would go visit. And so when we realized that we couldn't have Jay at the store because he scared the customers, I gave Tommy a key to the house and he would just come get Jay and he would take him for hours and hours of walks and then bring him back. And then eventually we just let Jay go live with Tommy. And, and do you have, do you have store dogs today? We, no, we've never, we never got a store dog again. <laughs> never did again. <laughs> never. I know I have a dog, uh, but we have a couple of our stores have store cats, but we've never gotten a dog again. You know, when I, now when I think about it, it's a good country store with a nice old lazy Labrador, you know, laying in the doorway. You can visualize that. I think not 175 pound Great Dane. Uh, and then the last name is Shane. Yeah. I want everybody to read my book so that they can read about Shane. Um, Shane came to work with us. He was, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks clean from um, a crystal meth addiction. And he was attending rehab at a clinic down the street from Logan Hardware. And he came and worked with us for 11 months. I gave him a job. I didn't care that he was, you know, in rehab. I, first, I didn't give him a job, which is part of the story and how fun our relationship was, the, the fun history. But I gave him the job. He worked with us for 11 months. He got really, really mad one day, and he stomped out. He said he never wanted to see us again. He hated us. We were terrible. I can't even say it without laughing because we're such good friends now. Um, I know so much more now about addiction and how people handle it and, and, and recovery that a year was not a long time for Shane to be clean. He was very fragile in his recovery. Um, I, I'm not sure. In, in a lot of ways, that fragility never ends, but it was very new. What I didn't know at the time is that even though he left and said he was never going to come back again, he went back to his rehab meetings and he started telling everybody there that they should come work at my store. <laughs> and so he kept saying, go see the lady at the hardware store. Go see." The and of course, I think it sounds funny. I was 30, I guess I was 31. I mean, you can call a 31-year-old a lady, but you know, when he tells it, it's just, go. I don't know. It's very comical to me. And so... <laughs> Shane started sending people who would apply for jobs and I kept hiring them. And then that person would bring somebody and that person would bring somebody and the common thread could be drawn back to Shane. And about three years later, this is how we talk about it now. He was early in recovery and I was early in entrepreneurship and it is not fair to compare the two because I, so I'm not doing that uh, in a in a broader sense, but I could not keep two thoughts in my head. I was so busy trying to figure out how to fix people's toilets and make paint and keys and pay payroll and all of the things that you have to do when you're running a, a, a really robust retail business. And so I didn't think about the fact that I probably should have called him and said, hey, why did you leave? Or, hey, did we do something wrong? Um, so I didn't see him for three more years. He came back three years later. He was doing the 12-step program, and he got to the step that uh, requires that you make amends. And he came to apologize. And I remember being mortified, like, you're sorry. You know, I was the boss. I didn't call you to say, 
hey, can I do something to make your life better? Uh, and that was a turning point for Shane and I. We, we, we never, ever lost touch after that. And he, he hosted the, a big launch party for my book. And we've done sort of road shows together on a couple of podcasts. He runs his own restaurant now. And the story is just amazing. I, I love the story throughout the book, the idea of the fact that a store, you know, I was listening to a, uh, one of my favorite man, management gurus, a guy named Tom Peters. And Tom Peters, yep. this morning, literally, I was hearing him say that a business is not part of a community. For many people, a business is the community. And it's funny that yep. I'm talking to you the same day that I hear that, how you've made sure that, uh, that your businesses are part of the community. Yes. The book is called Recovery Hardware, a nuts and bolts story about building a business, restoring a community, and renovating lives and just what a what a story it is gina where do we get the book recoveryhardware.com i want everyone to support their local bookstore so truly you can buy it from your local bookstore order it they probably won't have it or sure. from bookshop bookshop dot um dot org or recoveryhardware.com awesome thank you so much for helping stackers become a better part of their community gina i really appreciate it thank you i appreciate it too have a great afternoon Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist, Gina. What happens in the after show stays in the after show, okay? Th those are the Great. rules, sister. Okay. Right. I'm silent. <laughs> the, the, uh, well, you've got a part of your book that I thought normally we don't ask our guests to hang out and then, and then be part of the after show, but you've got some bloopers you've learned in, in your time owning hardware stores. And if you don't mind, I'd like you to pontificate on a few of these. Number one, move your thumb when you swing the hammer. How many times have you seen this? People come in with a black and blue thumb. All the time. Happens all the time. Or the thumb missing. I mean, we've had the thumbs missing. No. Oh, yeah. It's real. <laughs> oh, that one is that one's so bad. I feel like, by the way, our local uh, Ace Hardware is Dots, and I've moved a couple times in town, and I'm in Dots, and I love the people there. But I feel like whenever I move, like I feel like I need a frequent flyer card sometimes. Like they're like Joe back for the fifth time today. <laughs> like you, you must, you must see that too, where people are like, yeah, had I remembered the first four times, Gina. Hey, Number long two, you're still smiling. <laughs> yeah, I would say that by time number five, I'm forcing a smile for yeah. my friendly ace employee, not yes. for, yeah. Yes. Uh, number two, this is, this is, this one's pretty critical. Don't drink beer <laughs> until after you've painted the, tell me until after you painted the walls, tell me no. this is a true story. It's probably not appropriate to even have that blooper in a book about recovery. Right. But I remember lots of times, in fact, I was profiled on the Washington post about how to have a painting party. Young people can't afford to hire painters. So you invite your friends over. And I had a friend who painted my window blinds because we were drinking beer while we were painting. And I mean, I could call him all sorts of names, but it's my fault for serving him. And he was talking and rolling and then rolled right up my brand new white window blind with a dark blue paint. Yeah, don't do it. Oh, that's, that's so great. Uh, we would do that. I remember painting parties when I was yeah. younger. I mean, don't get me wrong. These are now the best checks I could ever write because I don't want to do these anymore. That one in moving parties. Remember, right. hey, just some pizza, pizza and beer. And yeah. Right. And now I remember I got to a certain age. Maybe it was in my 40s sometime. And I'm like, nope, can't. I'm busy that day. You'll write Studying for my blood yep. test. Yeah, please. Number three. Oh, God. Turn off the water supply before pulling a faucet out of the wall. Oh, this is when people come in and they're mad at us. I mean, so mad. It's almost always a plumbing issue because they at don't you. turn off the water at, supply. At, and they're mad at you. Yeah. Well, we take the brunt of it, even though we have nothing to do with it in that case. But yeah, they, you know, they've just flooded their kitchen. And so not only do they need plumbing parts, but they always also need buckets and rags and mops. And it's bad. I, I understand, Gina, that, that, um, that, you know, people forget stuff or they don't know stuff. Blaming you is the part that drives me crazy. Like not knowing to turn off the water. Okay. Everybody, yeah. you know, learns all this home improvement stuff at one point or another. I have a friend that on his desk, he has a phrase, it says, can't fix stupid. <laughs> and, uh, and don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't think, I don't think not turning your water off is stupid. I think that's fine. I think blaming you 
as the person. I don't know. Oh my god, I wonder uh, if we would still have customers if we hung that sign at our hardware store. <laughs> no. All, always buy more than one mouse trap is the next one. Yeah. So if you read the story of Lawson in my in my book, he is notorious for telling customers there's always more than one. If you see yeah. one, and he's had more than one customer cry when he's told them that. I had a friend tell me that after I caught the mouse. They're like, yeah, it's a family. No, I'm yeah. like, oh, God, no. Please, no. Yeah. Please, no. Yeah. My dad told me this next one 50,000 times. Measure twice, cut once. Yes. Somebody come back in for another uh, two by four. My, uh, my manager, no- I have a manager that likes to say, it's not what we need to learn. It's what we need to remember. And good Lord, we need to remember that, <laughs> that one. I, I could... I could use a tattoo with that one. Yeah. And, and, and that actually applies, by the way, for hanging stuff, right? For oh. on the wall. Like, how many times have I been told that to clearly mark it? I'm like, nope, I can take my finger. And then my finger moves, and I think I know where it is. And then I just hit a nail. And now I've got five different nail markings. Which you try and hide with the same piece of art so that you can't see it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Classic. <laughs> Classic error. And then next... And, and I don't know where this one comes from, but this is awesome. There's no such thing as a mail-to-mail electrical plug. <laughs> People do that all the time at Christmas. They'll come in and they'll get to the end of their, they need to attach two, two strands. And for whatever reason, the way they need to attach them have both male ends. And we're like, no, that doesn't exist. And you might electrocute yourself every year. It's such an old the, hardware the, joke. I can't get, I can't get like an adapter that has, no. you know, female ends on the no you cannot <laughs> one star for that gina that's one star i'm blaming you for that you need, no i'm kidding don't do it 